Um, okay, so uh, I posted the midterm grades. Um, I guess you probably saw, you probably got some sort of notification about that. Um, I think people did quite well. Um, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's, there were a couple tricky points, but I think overall people did very well. And, you know, I mean, usually, um, you want to kind of, you know, at least you want, you want to get parts A and B. Those are the setup, um, part C good to get. And then part D, you know, you don't like, I mean, it's not required that you, you get a hundred percent through the way for part D. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's. It's uh, it's usually a little back weighted, so like D ends up being like one of the part B's was like finding the factor prices, which is like really short, and then part D was like solve the entire model. So, um, but yeah, so you know, it, it's a little uneven, but um, I think it's probably it's it's a little better that way. But uh, I think you know, so people did did quite well. Um, I think probably uh, there were no there was nothing that like no one got. I think I think everything. Somewhere or another got um I think the, the the probably the toughest part was just getting all of the equilibria for part one in, in D. Okay, it's basically that you can get uh a, a sort of a static outcome and then a, a growth outcome. Okay, so your your ratio of K to M of the capital to machines always is gonna converge to that um the ratio of their savings rates. So S S K over S M for in this case, uh, because they have the same depreciation rates, but then like whether those two are growing over time or converging is is uh, dependent on parameters, basically. Okay, um, and, and essentially it's because that linearity between labor and machines. Anytime you have something where they're sort of being added together linearly rather than being like Cobb Douglas or something like that, uh, you can get sort of two very radically different outcomes. Okay, um, so yeah, I mean, there's the question of are they really linearly substitutable, probably not. Okay, so maybe maybe that's a reason to take this with a grain of salt, but in, if you do go to that limit, then you can get these different outcomes, okay? Um, yeah, and so, because essentially if you, if, uh, let's see, if, if you're using machines and capital, those are both physical capital, you're basically using all machines of some variety, okay? At which point it's gonna be similar to an AK model that where you just have a uh, productivity a times capital being your output where we, you can actually get growth same thing it because it's like crs and two things that are basically both machines you're you're fully like sort of mechanized economy can can grow okay you're not constrained by population okay um <clears throat> yeah so that and i think the, the only thing um some you, you do want to keep in mind for the one thing was that like when you transform into we transform into a which was the ratio of k over m and then B, which was the, the the sort of overall intensity of machines, which is M over one plus M. But then once you do that, B has to be basically between zero and one, okay? You can entertain the equations that you got for B greater than one, but like, there's just no way to end up with B greater than one. Okay, so you do wanna factor in, you know, there are just places when you do these transforms that become sort of, you just can't go there, okay? Um, yeah, and then I guess the only, there was some, there was some confusion which which might have been partially my fault about uh like per capita okay so i mean per it when i say per capita i mean just divided by l i probably was a i've been a little bit um loose in the lecture about what i'm exactly i'm saying so but in general and and on the exam if you did over al it's fine i didn't really take off points as long as you kind of took this as long as you did the right steps it's, it's going to give you the same answer uh anyway so um but, you know, if I do say per capita, it really is one over L. If I say normalized, then it sort of can be whatever. Okay, so I guess um, there's no real good term for, like, AL, like, a sort of, like, technology normalized too, but it's there's no, like, concise term for that. But um, in general, if I just say per capita, then it's just divide by L. Okay. Um, but it's not a big deal. So, um, okay, so that's that's it. If you, if you got questions, I mean, I would go over the exam to see what you got, um, what you missed, um, uh, and, uh, you know, sort of pivot accordingly. Um, and then, uh, if you got any questions, so, you know, let me know. Um, happy to talk about it. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, yeah. Okay. So I guess we can, we can, um, start up, uh, I am recording for the record. I'm recording this lecture. I, I think I need to, last lecture may not be up on YouTube. 
I think I need to like enable it, um, but I'll, I'll do that today. Um, okay, but but so we can pick up where we left off last time, basically with endogenous growth. Okay, so um, do you remember last time we uh, we well first we did that semi endogenous growth stuff. Okay, that's still kind of applicable. Okay, that's like a more general. That's like a a way to think about these models. Okay, and we're we're looking at more specific models, but kind of we can always go back and in the aggregate map it into some sort of uh, classification, like especially in terms of is the phi or phi equivalent thing greater or less than one or equal to one, okay? Um, but for now, we're kind of, uh, we're sort of in the, the thick of things thinking about um, this production, okay? So we have, you know, um, the the sort of, we're, we're, we're figuring out what's going on in the product markets, basically, given our whole production setup and technology, okay? So in this case, the, you know it's important to remember what is what is technology in this case so in this case technology is is just the number of products okay which is which we're calling n okay so um did i yeah so like you know we had this aggregator and i and the, i don't know if people will pick up on this necessarily but when you ag, the reason i put an alligator there is the gator is short for alligator okay you know so it's uh yeah um and i'm a big emoji fan i don't know if i mentioned that. i probably did but I'm a big emoji fan. I think they're cool. And I think uh, maybe in the future, we'll all be using emoji that we combine together, in which case they would look kind of like characters, but I don't know. We'll see. Maybe we won't see because we probably won't live that long, but um, it'll happen. Okay. Um, so yeah, uh, the, the the aggregator here has that end parameter, okay, um, which is just the, the total number of products. So that's it. Okay. That's technology. In the future, we're going to, do different models where technology is sort of a higher dimensional object. But in this case, it's just N, okay? And because all of the products are the same, okay, they just, the, the integral here, you know, there's no weight, there's no difference, it's just YI and they all go in, in symmetrically. Technology can basically be described by N, okay? Um, so uh, that's it. And so, so later on, we'll have different stuff like the productivity of producing these things or whatever, but for now, it's just the number of products, more products is good in a particular way. Okay. So, um, so, so yeah. Okay. So that's one thing is sort of what's our, you want to keep track of what is, what is your technology state variable? Okay. So this, in this case, it's N. All right. And so, so we went, we went through, all right. We solved, we thought about things from the perspective of the, the, the final good producer. Okay. And they take prices as given. Okay. They take all those PIs as given. Then they choose YI optimally to maximize their profits. Okay. But they do so this competitive, okay, so they're, 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 um, let's see, uh, it's competitive in the sense that they're taking prices as given. They can't influence prices with their choice of, of how much to buy. Okay, so they're, they're taking prices as given and that they choose an optimal YI. Okay, um, <clears throat> and what that gives you is, is it gives you YI as a function of PI. Okay, uh, so it gives you a, uh, the demand function. Okay, um, and so, <clears throat> Once you've solved that, then you can kick it down to the the firm that's actually producing that little that individual I good, okay, which we're just assuming is one firm per I. Okay, so each product is produced by one monopolistic firm. Um, <clears throat> they're gonna take that as given. So they say, okay, well, I'll choose a price. If I choose a higher price, I mean, it's standard logic. If I choose a higher price, I get more per unit, but also I sell less, and so the the, the optimum should be some middle point, okay. Uh, and then also, of course, I have costs to, to worry about too. Um, uh, but but there's going to be some optimum going on there. Okay, so um, that's what we're going to do now. Okay, so but but last time when we did that optimization, we found this. Um, well, okay, so this is phrased in terms of an inverse demand function. Okay, so it, whether you map from p to y or y to p doesn't particularly matter. Okay. Um, it's a one-to-one -one mapping, okay? Um, so, so yeah, but this, this one, you know, because we're mapping from Y into P in this particular slide, that's gonna be an uh, inverse demand function. But if you if we go here, okay, there's a lot going on, but if you look at the top, at the bottom right here, uh, you know, this would be inverse demand form, okay? And then this would be the demand function form, okay? So, that, but, you know, the higher price you choose, the, the less you sell, okay? Um, all right. Okay, so then, and then we're going to look at the intermediate um, producer's problem. Okay, so the, in, the intermediate producer, um, 
let's just call that producer i producer of i okay um they're okay so the, first of all their profit just in the most general sense okay is going to be fairly simple it's just the price of what they're selling times how much they sell minus w times how much uh labor l they how many people they employ okay and they're going to pay a wage w which is we're taking as given it'll be sold in equilibrium too okay um and uh yeah so the way the just as background the wage is paid to to any worker okay so if you're a production worker working at one of these firms you're gonna get paid your wage wage w uh but you can also we'll see choose to be a research worker and work for a a, a firm doing as a researcher um you're also going to get paid w okay which i think is very inspiring for you guys getting your phd that you're going to get a wage surplus of zero uh but you know uh so it's a simplification we could we could put put a wedge there and it would still work out it's just like we're going to keep things simple for now okay so anyone can do research um but anyone can do production okay and uh yeah and then the other thing is you know the production of these intermediates as we said before it's very simple it's just you put in a certain amount of labor you get it out a certain amount of uh goods which is the exact same number okay um again we could put a coefficient on the front of that li an overall productivity that doesn't depend on i um it would not change anything about the model so it would just sort of it's it's kind of with that because it's because uh, there's no units really uh, defining Ys, Yis or, or overall Y, the goods, you know, there's sort of a degree of freedom there that we can just sort of normalize that productivity to one. That's where we choose to put it. Okay. Um, all right. So then, yeah. And so then with that, you know, this is going to be basically Pi minus W, your um, uh, mar markup of price over cost in absolute terms times Yi, because that Li is Yi. All right, so, um, yeah, and then, uh, yeah, okay, and so that that's in the general sense, but of course we know um, that PI and YI are linked by this demand function that we get from the aggregate uh, good uh, producer. Okay, so um, we can we can sub in for one or the other. It doesn't make a huge difference, I guess. Um, so you can think about it as choosing price, uh, and then you you know that. That'll determine how much you sell and that'll determine your profit. Or you can think about it as choosing quantity and thinking, well, I want to sell all, everything I make. Uh, so I'm going to have to choose a specific price. And again, you'd get uh, a profit level for that. Okay. Um, I guess, let me see, do I, I, I kind of want to make, maybe I'll make it consistent with what I do in the slides. So in the slides, I'm doing um, P of Y. Okay. So let's do that. Okay. Um, and I'm also going to drop. Yeah, I'm gonna drop the i for a bit. All right. Well, oh, I'm solving this. Everything is is sub i, but I'll just write it as like, you know, um, you know, say, think about your particular firm choosing a price. Okay, p. All right, and so then uh, your profit's gonna look like you know p minus w times uh, not y times how much you sell. Okay, so that that's um, just dropping i subscripts. You know, if you, you you have a certain markup over cost w, uh, and you sell a certain amount, that's a function of p, right? Um, okay, and then uh, yeah, so now we can think about actually maximizing this. Okay, now we know um, from that pre previous slide. Okay, what do we? Let me make sure I get this right. Uh, we know that. PI is, uh, I guess I'll write it like this, YI over Y to the minus one over epsilon. Okay, so we know exactly actually what that P function is, um, or if you wanna, you know, think about the inverse, okay, then that's gonna be, let me make sure I actually get this right this time. YI is gonna be Y times PI to the minus epsilon, that's right, okay? So, so that's what we know from that, from the previous step, okay. Um, so then, I'll uh, let me let me do this in a general sense, and then because there's you can kind of see some um, that's sort of useful to do that, and then I'll and then I'll we'll, we'll look at it in a specific case, right? So I'm going to do it in the general sense of I'm going to do it for a general demand function, and then we'll plug in what we actually know our demand function is, okay? Um, 
Okay, actually, and it turns out that in the lecture I did it the opposite way. Okay, so let's we we can equivalently write this like this. All right, so pi. So, so, so those two are equivalent, right? It's just whether you think about P or Y as your choice variable, it's, it's, it's going to be equivalent, all right? Um, okay, so then let's let's maximize with respect to Y. Okay, and we'll get we'll get something, um, but just for a general P of Y function, for a general inverse demand function. Okay, so um, this over here, so del pi del Y, I guess it's, it's a, I mean, it's a partial derivative because it's also a total derivative since there's only one argument. Okay, so that's going to be, uh, well, we're going to take the derivative. So this times the derivative of the second, which is actually just one. Okay, that's a very wonky one. That's not going to stand. Times, I'm just going to omit it. It's gone. All right. Um, plus uh, derivative of the first times that second one. Okay, so the derivative of the first, w is going to drop out. W is, is constant. Okay. And then we're going to get uh, p dot p prime of y times y. Okay, I think that's right. That's right. Okay, so then uh, and that should be zero. Okay. Um, all right, and so uh, yeah, so now this so this is true in a general sense, and I mean there's not really that much you can do with it. Okay, but we can kind of rearrange it um, in an interesting way. Okay, in particular. Um, we, we can we can turn this into an elasticity based formula, kind of like we would do with the consumption uh, utility uh, elasticity and theta from before. Um, so first subtract. Okay, so we're gonna get p of y minus w is equal to minus p prime of y times y. Okay, so now p prime p prime is neg is negative. Okay, because um, if you Produce more, you're gonna be able to sell that for less. You're flooding the market. Uh, you know more the price. Okay, so um, the thing on the right is positive, hence, and uh, therefore the you know, p of y is greater than w. The cost that you charge is gonna be greater than your your marginal cost. So that's kind of usually gonna be true, right? Um, and then let's also divide this by p of y. Okay, so now we're gonna get so the absolute markup divided by uh the price itself okay so like a proportional not quite a proportional markup but we'll get there all right um but if we do this then we're going to get minus p prime of y times y over p of y okay so that that's an elasticity okay um uh it's the the derivative times the the x value which confusingly in this case is y uh divided by the value itself Okay, so that that's an elasticity of of this p function. Okay, so then, uh, and I'm gonna incorporate. So this is like a triple equals defining it. Uh, I'm gonna incorporate the minus sign into it just so so that the thing that we're defining is a positive number, right? This is positive. I didn't kind of call it epsilon p. So that's the elasticity of demand, epsilon p. Okay, um, which is like you know we have the the sort of general classical notion of elasticity of demand, this is like, you know, specific mathematical formula, formalization of that. Okay. Um, all right. And so that, but this is, uh, well, yeah, so, so this is P minus Y over P. So it's the, the price markup over cost divided by the price itself. Um, in, in general, I think most, when people think about a price markup, you think about the ratio of the, the cost that you're selling it for to your input cost. Okay, that's that's the typical notion of a, of a markup. But we can get from this equation, you know, we can we can actually, you know, this is one, this is basically one minus, sorry, this is one minus W over P. So we can we can actually find P over W just by subtracting one and, and dividing. Okay, so from here you get basically P over W should be epsilon over uh, epsilon p over epsilon p minus one. Okay. Um, let me just make sure that this is not too bad. Minus one. Okay. So, so you, you subtract that one. Uh, let's see, how does this work? Interesting. Let me just make sure these slides are right here. 
I got. I, I remember when I was writing the slides. I was also very confused. Um. Ah. Okay. 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 So, <clears throat> right, this this is this is this is not one hundred percent correct. Okay. So let's starting from here. <clears throat> this thing is one minus w over p. Okay. Here. All right. It's just dividing through the p. Um. So then, if we think about one over one minus this thing. Okay, then we're going to get p over w. So this will be one over one minus epsilon p. Okay, so if we take that this thing this thing here is equal to epsilon p. One over one minus this thing is p over w. So that's one over one minus epsilon p. Okay. Um, all right, and so then uh, that's well, I guess. This is sort of what this is in some sense a result. Okay, in a, in a general sense, okay, is that if you know if you have this simple situation with a linear cost type uh, linear production basically here, okay, over here, if you have the linear production and you have a certain elasticity of price, okay, and you think about what's your optimal uh, at the optimal production level, what's your price markup over cost? It's going to be this thing here. One over one minus that elasticity. Okay, so um, <clears throat> and if if we think about you know in our particular case, okay, this is where it gets confusing because in our particular case, the elasticity of price is actually what we're calling one over epsilon. Okay, so that not ideal, but what can you do? Okay, so um, because uh, let's see, if you look up here. Uh, if you look at, like right here, you know you, this that elasticity is basically this thing here. Okay, so I, you know, um, did I? Did we derive? I mean, we may not have actually. I can't remember if we did that. You know, so so if you remember, like the uh, marginal utility for CRA is c to the minus theta. Okay, and that meant that the elasticity when you take the elasticity of that, you just pick up the exponent, which was theta. Okay, so anytime you take an elasticity of a function. That's just a power. You basically just pick up that exponent, okay? Um, because if, if you if you think about what what is this doing, you're taking the derivative, which pops off the exponent. You're canceling out the fact that you lost one of the powers, and then you're dividing by the original thing, which just cancels any of the power dependence at all. So, what really, what you're doing here is, is is just like, you know, cooking it up so that you pop off the exponent and cancel out everything else, okay? By by undoing the loss of that one. Uh, from the derivative, in a, if it's a you know some some power function, and dividing by that dividing through by it. Okay, so if you think here, take the derivative, you're going to get a minus one over epsilon. Then you're going to decrement this, but then you're going to undecrement it, and just divide by the whole thing, canceling out anything but that thing that epsilon that one over epsilon you popped off. Okay, and then also the the minus sign will we'll cancel the minus. Okay, so we're just going to get that the elasticity of this thing here is just one over epsilon. Okay, and anytime you see a power function, and you, you just want to know the elasticity. If it's a simple power function, just take the exponent of the actual variable, which in this case is yi. Okay, and you're all set. All right. So, um, and then you can also think about what's the elasticity of of uh, this y function, the demand function itself. Well, just for the reason that we said, you know, if, if we also were to to throw in a minus sign there, you know, that would be minus. Uh, y prime of p times p over y of p, right? That's going to be, you, that's, if you just look at the uh, exponent there, it's going to be epsilon, okay, with the minus cancels. Okay, so that's going to be epsilon. Okay, so then we can see that the, you know, p, p, the p function and the y function are inverses of one another, right? That's how we deride them. And then you can see their elasticities are multiplicative inverses of one another. It's not a coincidence, you know, if you have, um, yeah, so that the, in general, the elasticity of the inverse of a function is going to be the multiplicative, you know, one over the elasticity of the original function. Okay. So, um, yeah, so that's just, this is, this is sort of all just general stuff about elasticities, but it's going it, to, in this case, uh, it's, it's fairly useful. Okay. And so if we plug that in, we're going to get one over one minus one over epsilon okay which which is a little clunky so let's multiply by epsilon and we're going to get epsilon over epsilon that's one 
Okay. So um, so that we so we derive it for the general case, right? We get which is it which you know that price markup is just going to be a function of the elasticity of, of the the inverse demand function, and then for our particular case, we get epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay. So um, okay. So but what does this all mean? All right. Uh, well, basically, um, you can see that. <clears throat> Uh, this this elasticity of demand, uh, inverse demand here, as as long as um, epsilon is greater than one, which typically we're assuming that epsilon is, is greater than one. Okay, this is going to be some number between zero and one. One over epsilon is going to be between zero and one. Okay, so this this thing is going to remain, you know, well defined. Okay, although it will approach a limit. Okay, so if you think about uh, uh, well, actually, okay, so we can, maybe we should think about it in terms of, of epsilon. As epsilon goes to infinity, regular epsilon, as epsilon goes to infinity, remember in our, uh, let me pull up the goods aggregator in the slides. Um, what's going up? Oh, sorry, I was looking at the wrong thing. I just like jumped around like three different times. Okay, uh, if we go to the, the back to the slides, um, this is going to be, Converge into a linear function as epsilon goes to infinity, okay, um, and then pop back to uh, the the notes here or the the written notes. Then you can see that this is going to converge to one, okay. So in a linear case, this gets back to that substitutability you know, substitutability notion. In the linear case, um, everything is perfectly substitutable. You're not gonna you don't have any market power, okay, and so you're not going to charge. You have to charge marginal cost basically, okay, because people will just buy something else. If if you didn't, okay, so so that's there. Your markup is going to get pushed down to one in the linear case when epsilon goes to infinity. As epsilon goes to one, okay, then this thing, well, this this denominator is going to get, you know, close to zero, and hence the the markup is going to go to infinity. Okay, so as epsilon once goes to one, your markup goes to infinity, um, <clears throat> because if you if you look at this equation up here, um, you know, in either case. You know, when epsilon goes to one, you know, you get like y i equals y over p i, right? Which means that y i p i is equal to y, right? So your revenue, y i p i, is constant and not a function of your price, okay? So you get the same amount of money regardless of what price you charge, okay? So what you're going to do is just um, produce as little as possible. And the way you produce a very small amount is by charging a really, really high price, okay? Um, so that's, uh, so the intuition, you know, why do things break down as you get close to, to epsilon equals one is that your revenue becomes invariant to price. And so your only objective is to reduce costs, which means producing a very small amount, which means charging a very high price. Okay. Um, you still just make the same amount, basically P I Y I equals Y. Okay. But you don't make an infinite amount of profits, but you cho you do charge a very high price. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, yeah. Okay. So that's a price markup. Okay. And, and it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of important. I mean, it, it, it's a, it's an indicator of the, the level of market power that these firms have of the, of the, and, and, you know, monopoly distortions are a thing here. Okay. So it's, it's important to think about that, um, in, in the general sense. Okay. So, uh, and, and it'll, it'll be welfare relevant later on. Okay. Not, not exactly the markup because that's just a price that's an indicator of an allocation but but the the level of monopoly power will be important in a welfare sense as we go forward okay um all right so okay so so we have some we have something okay we have a little bit not everything not even close to everything but we have something okay so so uh in particular so now we know the price markup Okay, that's gonna so that it, going back to having uh, I subscripts, that price markup is gonna be epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay, it's relatively simple. Okay, now what we really want to know, just to give you an idea of what, where are we going with this, what we really want to know is is what's their profit level. Okay, which should be related to the price markup because profit is proportional to p minus w. Uh, but it's not exactly that. Right? So we're not quite there yet. Okay. Um, <clears throat> but 
but we can kind of work our way towards there. All right. Um, and so, yeah. Okay. So there's, there's multiple routes we can take here. Okay. So, so one thing we can do is say, well, we know what PI is from the demand function. We can find YI, and then we can just plug all that into the PI function and figure out, you know, we know how much charging and how it's producing. We know everything, at least conditional on W. Uh, so let's, let's just do that. Okay. Um, that's one option. Okay. The other option is we can come from a more aggregate aggregated perspective. Okay. And say, well, you know, we could find your quantity from the, the demand function. Okay. But we could also, we, we kind of know what the quantities are already from aggregate constraints and symmetry. We did this last time, basically. So I'm, I'm going to take, I guess I could do both in principle. Do it. Yeah. Well, I'll do both. Why not? Okay. So, um, you know, so, so from here, okay. You know, this means that, uh, you know, just multiplying over that PI is, uh, W times epsilon over epsilon minus one. Okay. Um, and that's going to mean that YI, okay. Remember, go back up here. YI is Y times PI to the minus epsilon. Okay. So what, so it's going to be Y times this thing, this one to the minus epsilon. Okay. So we can, it's not pretty. Okay. But we can, we can get an expression for YI. Okay. And then we know that, um, profit pi I is PI minus W times, uh, YI. Okay. Okay. And we can, we can plug that in. All right. Um, and you know, maybe actually it's not so bad. Okay. So what are we going to get? Well, so PI is this here, W times epsilon over epsilon minus one. If you subtract W, then you just end up with W over epsilon minus one. Okay. If you combine the fractions, subtract, subtracting one, basically from this fraction, you get one over epsilon minus one. Okay. So that's your, um, uh, P minus W and then Y I is just what we had so far here. Okay. Um, All right, and so that's not super great. Okay, um, I guess uh, we can combine. I mean, we could combine some terms. Okay, I guess uh, what's the best way to do this? I mean, we so we we can combine terms. Maybe I think the best way to do it is to express it like this. Okay, so at the end of the day, we can get something, yeah. And it, it's not pretty, but but it's something. Okay, uh, we are we are still we don't know what y is, we don't know what w is. Okay, so there's a lot we don't know. What we do know though, which which you kind of alluded to earlier, is that it's not going to depend on i. Okay, we've lost all dependence on i because the whole setup of the problem was symmetric. Okay, um, all right, and uh, you know if if we wanted to. Um, you know, if, if we want to fully solve the model or what profit is from here, okay, we need to know what Y and W are, okay? And so basically to know W, you sort of need to know um, what's going on at the labor market, okay? You want the, the W is going to clear the labor market, okay? Um, and to know why you can, you can plug everything back into the final goods aggregator and, and find out what Y is, okay? Um, but, but... It turns out that that's, it's just a lot of work and it's pretty messy. Okay. There's, there's another route that we can take, which is a lot easier. And we're going to be able to get to an answer much quicker without, uh, without as much algebra. Okay. Which is just kind of, ex, you know, sort of exploiting symmetry and, and looking at aggregates. Okay. So 
let's let's do that route okay because the, the route on the left is, is a real mess all right um okay so so let's think about eggs okay and we, we kind of did some of this before um so think about the the total uh, the labor market mm, constraint or not constraint but sort of clearing condition here is that the total amount of production labor okay that you have is going to be equal to the aggregate of, of, of what you're using at each product level uh, integrated overall products. Okay. Now th this is really kind of just a definition in some sense, right? Because, you know, I just invented P. So this is, you can think about this is the definition of P also. All right. So, um, because uh, in the background, let's say we have one unit of labor in total, we're going to have some production, but we're also going to have some research. Okay. So that's, up top here is, is our true labor market clearing condition. Okay. But we're going to, at, at this stage, um, we're going to, all we're going to track is, you know, how much in total labor is going to production and in total, how much labor is going to research. Okay. So that's the big societal level sort of decision, uh, that you can think about. Okay. And the, the reason we do that is that it's, 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 you know, because everything is symmetric, you know, kind of what we found over here, why, you know, y i is not a function of i, okay? And hence, not, neither is l i, because those are equal, okay? Um, and that means that this integral is sort of trivial. It's just n times l. I'll write i, but it's just whatever the common l is, okay? Um, which means that, in fact, that l i is just p divided by it. So you take all your production labor and it has to be divided evenly between each product line by symmetry and by what we found on the left. Uh, and if we know the total amount, we just divide by n to get the, the individual product line amount. Okay. So this just reflects the fact that, you know, as, as uh, you get more products and it's going to be growing without bound exponentially, you're putting less and less into each individual product because you just have a certain amount of labor, but you have more products and in, in net it ends up being good for production, but you are spreading your, your labor thinner and thinner. Okay. Um, all right. So then, uh, yeah. Okay. So how does this help us? Well, we can go back to that pi I equation. Okay. Um, all right. And what we're going to do is well, that, you know, so this is also y i. Remember, y i is equal to l i. So this thing on the left here we found also is equal to y i p over n. Okay, and so we're going to sub that in for y i instead of this ugly mess that we have on the left. Okay, so then sort of you know, step back and say, okay, well, this is our profit. Okay, we're going to plug in the elasticity thing we found. Okay, for p minus w. But then we're going to plug in this aggregate p over n for y. Okay. So then from this, we're going to get, you know, sort of the same thing, you know, p minus w is going to end up being w over epsilon minus one. Okay. You kind of combine the fractions. And then uh, y from just up above there is just going to be p over n. Okay. So, um, yeah, or if you want to, very slightly simplify. We can write it like this. Okay. Um, all right. So that's that's um, that's that's our profit. Okay. Um, now, what does this all mean? Okay. So so first of all, uh, why is this useful? Why is it? This is this is simpler than the thing on the left. Okay. Uh, but it still depends on W. Um, but it doesn't depend on y, okay, because we incorporate aggregates, okay? So it, it eliminates some dependence. W is still kind of floating around, and even P, we don't know what that is, okay? Um, the, essentially, what's going to happen is um, this is profit. We're going to turn this into a value, a present value. It's still going to be proportional to W, all right? And then uh, we're going to be... Um, Essentially, because research is done with labor as well and, and has sort of a marginal cost of W, we're going to be able to cancel the Ws out at some point. Okay, so so the fact that W is still sticking around, it's going to get canceled in the future. And so we're going to be able to just sort of solve for P itself. 
Okay, so that's that's the end game is is we're gonna cancel W and solve for P and everything's gonna be great. All right. Um, now in terms of what does this thing mean? Okay. Uh, well, essentially, th this actually in the end um, is is sort of like a a GDP style income equation. Okay. So remember, you know, from solo we usually find that Y is equal to RK plus WL that the the total income. Can be decomposed in you know it's basically you know uh, CRS kind of thing can be decomposed into uh, capital income and labor income and we even find that those are respectively the shares are respectively equal to alpha and one minus alpha okay so those are your income shares so here we kind of have something like that okay so look at this pi is equal to <clears throat> WP over epsilon minus one times n if you rearrange this you're going to get n pi, I'm just going to write pi. So pi is also invariant to i, as we can see now too. Okay, so I'll drop the i there. n pi over wp, think about that, is equal to 1 over epsilon minus 1. Okay, so what does this mean? Well, these are actually, this is a ratio of, of shares. Okay, so what's the total amount of production uh, income in this economy? It's the amount of production labor times w, so it's wp. Okay. What's the total amount of profit in this economy? It's n times pi. There's each each individual firm gets pi, and there's n different firms, one for each product, and so that's the total amount of profit. So the ratio of profits to uh, uh, production income is is some constant. Okay. Um, all right. So then in, you know in in solo Cobb Douglas world, we would find you know we usually find that the ratio of capital to labor income is alpha over one minus alpha for instance okay so here we can see the ratio of, of profits to labor production labor income is one over epsilon minus one okay so it, it's profits instead of capital but in the end those are often very similar okay uh so you, you're going to get some this, this the same ratio okay now <clears throat> uh there's there's some stuff lurking out there the qualifications of that statement uh one of which is you know this isn't all income wp because we're not including research income okay this is a this uh, so, so this is a statement about the production side sort of in isolation okay but in the broader sense there is labor income going to researchers okay so that's why we don't have you know that profits are equal to this constant times output and, and that labor income is equal to this constant times output, but we can talk about the ratio as being equal to some parametric constant, okay? We'll even get the answer, you know, to the true income shares, you know, exactly how much is going to each once we solve the entire model, because we need to figure out how much is going to production versus research in terms of, of labor, okay? So, but, but we can get something close to an income share equation here. All right, so then... Um, and and this this arises i don't know this this kind of arises because of uh the nature of the production function that we chose basically just like a cobb douglas you know alpha is going to the, the determines the nature of production function here our parameter on the production function will determine the split between profit and uh and labor okay or capital capital like stuff and labor okay all right so um Okay, then this we'll just call this pi. All right, so so that's, yep. Uh, which uh, which which one? Uh huh. Wait, this at epsilon. Epsilon, yep. Yeah. Okay. Um. It, it's what's well, greater than one. It's it's greater than one, uh, it, but it can be anything. Um, so remember, the, this isn't an income share. It's the ratio of these two, right? So so it, uh, the only, it should just be something. Um, let's see. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, so that's and that's that's um oh I see what you're saying. Can can total profit uh 
can total pre so total profit can be more than it can be more than the the input costs uh as long as revenues are sufficiently large and um yeah so yeah they don't have to there's no ordering that has to hold here in this case um it should i mean it should be that uh yeah input costs should be less than revenues but they don't have to be less than costs yeah so so all because epsilon greater than one all, all it tells us is some positive number basically right okay yep cool um okay so then uh where can we go from here well we're gonna we're gonna run with this oops we're gonna run with this pi equation here okay so pi just i'll rewrite this down here we have pi is equal to wp over epsilon minus one times n okay um all right so now this is where we're, we're gonna go for that end game of, of canceling w um and 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 uh comparing that about some some type of net present value notion okay to to a research cost okay so because the so we're, we we have pi okay we're going to turn that into a value okay essentially by dividing by by a, a discount rate okay that's and, and i'll show you exactly how we do that in a second um and and so then we, we have this value and it's going to tell us what's the net present value of getting a new product line right because when you get a new product line you start getting profit pi and you get that forever you're never kicked out. You're never displaced. You just get it forever, and you have a, an infinite length patent. Let's say, uh, keeping you as the monopolist. Okay, um, so you can think about the net present value of that profit stream as being v. Okay, that's the benefit of generating a new product. Okay, we're gonna have some uh, cost function. Okay, uh, that's gonna um, let me think. Uh, yeah, it's. It's, it's going to be proportional to W, okay? Because you have to, you, in, in, it's going to be proportional, let's, let's see, to um, the cost, you're going to spend, you're going to hire researchers to, to generate new products, okay? And you have to pay those researchers W, okay? And so you're going to, you're going to compare that against something like W uh, being your marginal. Like, so let's say one researcher produced one new product in expectation your marginal cost of producing a product would then just be W. Okay. If, if the researchers had a productivity of one. So now, you know, in general, researchers can have, you know, it might be that they only produce a new product with probability 1% or 5% or whatever, but they'll have some productivity, but we can ignore that for now. Uh, so you're going to compare some marginal cost, which is going to be a, a proportional W with this value, which is also going to be proportional to W. Okay. And so that, that those are going to cancel. And you, we're basically going to end up on a, with an equation that'll tell us uh, it, it's going to give us a, um, one equation that we can solve to find p, okay? Um, or we could solve it to find r. Okay, so finding p, if you look up top here, finding p or r, they're just one minus each other. It's the same thing. We're going to get a single equation, which is going to tell us about the allocation between um, uh, production and, and research, okay? And, and this comparison here is what's going to be called the free entry condition. Okay. Because we're going to... Yeah. So it's going to be... Because pi is linear in W, V is also going to be linear in W. Yeah. Um, so so that, that we're going to create some equality. It's a free entry condition. And, the, and so it, it, it's basically going to say, well, you know, the, the marginal benefit of creating a new product should be equal to the marginal cost, okay? If, if that weren't the case, then there would be more entrants coming in and trying to create new products, and eventually things would equilibrate and make that thing true. If it if the if the marginal benefit were less than the marginal cost, then everyone would just give up creating new products, and again, we, we'd, we'd have some equilibration process, okay? So the, that's, a, that's a sort of standard free entry logic, is that if you have free entry, then something should happen to equate the marginal benefit with the marginal cost, okay? We don't really specify the equilibration process itself. We just say that it should equilibrate somehow. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, and so that's 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 gonna the free entry condition really is just the sort of the final equation that ties everything together. We just need to make sure we we plug in stuff to the free entry uh, condition such that we can solve for basically one variable in this case. Okay. I mean that, that's not always possible with a sufficiently complicated model, you're gonna get a bunch of equations, but we're going to be able to to do that. 
Okay, so um, yeah, uh, good. All right, so then um, let's do that. All right, so so that we need to do two things. For, first, you know, we need to NPV that profit, that present value, that profit into a value. Okay, and then we'll plug that into the, a free entry condition. Okay, so I, what I things I haven't told you are. What's the what's the production function for ideas? Okay, how do we produce ideas and, and stuff like that? So maybe I'll just give you a preview. The production function for ideas is going to look like this. So you're going to produce new ideas, some constant times n times r, right? So you you're going to put in researchers. They're going to this is a and the, here you can see phi equals one. In, in the the old remember uh, phi is the coefficient attached to the technology parameter, which is n instead of a, that equals one. And then here also that eta is the, the returns to scale. There's actually none here. Um, so this is a phi equals one, eta equals one world. If you want, if we use that old Jones taxonomy, okay. And because it is that that phi equals one knife edge, you get that the growth of um, technology of, of new products is, is gamma times r. So it's sensitive two are the number of people doing research. Okay. Um, okay. So that, so that, so that, that's going to give us our French equation because you're going to be able to say, okay, I, I put in a certain amount of researchers uh, that generate new products that have value V and I'm comparing that to their marginal cost, which is basically W. Okay. And, and so that's going to give us our, our French equation. Okay. So let me, um, but we need to do this NPV thing first. Okay, so we'll keep that on ice for a second. We're going to plug in some, we're going to utilize that to, to make a French equation in a bit. We just need to find the value. Okay, so to do that, okay, um, we're going to need to think, of, I'll, I'll give you sort of a general statement here about values and how to, to compute them. Okay, so, um, so yeah, values. Okay. Um, all right. So we have some profit. Just all we need to know is that we have some profit stream pi. It's con in this case, it's constant over time. All right. Although you could think about IMT. It actually doesn't really matter for what I'm going to do here. Um, and then, uh, and then we have some notion. We need to have a discount rate, basically. Okay. Um, so we're going to have some discount rate. Let's just call it R of T or something like that. Okay, so so I'm going to call it R because um, actually, well, I, I actually maybe I, I I was quick to say it is a discount rate. It's going to be a discount rate, but but really it's an interest rate at this point. Okay, so you're a firm. Okay, um, and let's just say you're facing an interest rate. It turns out it turns out that if you're facing an interest rate R you should use that as your discount rate. Okay, so I, I think that's the correct order to put it in. So that if, if you, you are told sort of, as or you know as a firm, you, you're, you have some interest rate R by which you can save and borrow, then it is optimal to value things uh, such that R is your discount rate. Okay, so then, um, yeah, and the way, the way you can think about that uh, is you have some profit stream Pi, okay, that you can, um, that's associated with this firm, okay, this, it's the profit stream associated with the firm, okay, and then uh, you want to, you want to find V, what's the value, the net present value of that firm, okay, at time T, for instance, uh, so V is basically the stock price, okay, V is the stock price, um, pi you can think about pi is you know, the profits of a firm, and let's say that they give them out as dividends, which is actually not standard to, to give out all your profits as dividends, but let's say they do it. Um, and then let's say that there's R as your interest rate so that you can you can save and borrow uh, at rate R, okay? So then how, can, can we use that those simple facts to generate an expression for V? I'd say yes, okay? so. And here's here's the logic, okay? Um, sort of like thought experiment style logic, okay? Essentially, um, the value should kind of satisfy a sort of no arbitrage condition. No arbitrage 
condition. Okay. All right. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, it, given whatever the expression for the value is, you shouldn't be able to sort of make free money on that. Okay. Um, and so, uh, and in this case, that means that you shouldn't, um, what, how, how would you make free money? Well, you would, you would borrow money on the bond market at rate R. You'd buy the stock, hold it for a bit, and then give that money back. You'd pay that money back. Okay. Um, we, we shouldn't be able to do that. Okay. And that, that's how we're going to get this expression for the value. Okay. Um, all right. And so what is it? What, is, what would that look like? Uh, so that would look like what? So you, let's think about this whole operation in its totality. This little schema I'm, I'm going to cook up here. You're going to get uh, you're going to get some money today. You're going to borrow it. You're going to pay it back tomorrow with interest. You're going to buy the stock today, get the dividends and pocket any change in the, the stock price. So there's actually a lot going on here, but let's, let's, let's compute. So you're going to get some money today. Uh, and let's say you borrow, you want to buy the stock. You want to buy one share of the stock. So you're going to borrow V of T. So, so, so what are our operation? We're going to borrow V of T dollars. Okay. We're going to buy one share of company X, whatever it is. All right. Then we're going to pay it. We're going to pay that back uh, later on. Okay. So, uh, we're going to, uh, borrow V of T. We're going to buy that stock, which costs us VFT. So we just spent all our money again. Um, and then, uh, well, if we own the stock though, we're going to get dividends. Okay. And, and actually we're, we're in a, we need to sort of discretize things. So let's call it the dividends. We're going to get our Delta times pi of T. So, so we own the stock for an instant. We're going to get Delta times pi of T. Okay. Uh, we are going to then enjoy that delta period, however fleeting it may be, get that delta times pi of t. The stock will have slightly changed price. We're going to, we're going to sell the stock and pocket and, and get the money of its new price, which is t plus delta. Okay. So we got the dividends. We also implicitly are getting any change in the stock by holding it. Okay. Um, and what else we need to worry about? Well, we still kind of have that money. We wouldn't have any unfortunate incidences with our, uh, with our lenders. So we need to pay them back. All right. Uh, so we need to give them one plus Delta R. So the, the interest rate is going to be, you're going to pay back, sorry, V of T. So you borrowed V of T. So you're going to pay back one plus in, in, in a discrete setting, it would be one plus R times V of T. We're in continuous time. So it's actually one plus Delta times R. Okay. Which is sort of an approximation to, continuous compounding, but, but for small delta, it's fine. Okay. So, so we're going to pay them back one plus delta times R. Okay. Um, the, yeah. So you borrow V of T, then you turn around and spend all of that money buying the stock. So you, you in terms of your cash balances, you lose that again, you get the stock, right? But you lose V of T, you, you spend V of T dollars or whatever your currency is, right? So, so you, you, you know, it, it immediately cancels because you just borrowed the money and then it, it buys something else with it. So, yeah. Um, okay, so this is this is this this scheme that I've cooked up, all right? And no arbitrage says that this scheme should not make me any money, nor should it lose, it shouldn't lose me any money because I could also reverse the scheme. Uh, I could, well, I guess I'd have to like short the, I don't know. I, I can, I can reverse it. I think I'd have to short the stock and then l lend money to people and then buy the stock back at the end, which is introduces, it sounds more complicated, but in, in a frictionless market, it should, should be allowed. Okay. So, uh, but let's just do the forward time version and then see what that yields. Okay. So, um, all right. So, so stuff's going to cancel. All right. So first of all, these, the first two terms are just, they just cancel right away. Okay. So, 
Then we're left with uh, delta times pi of t. Okay. Um, and then, uh, well, okay. I mean, I'll just write it out. Okay. V of t plus delta. Okay. Um, yeah, and then I guess uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna write it out like this. So so this is like our uh, well we kind of want this to be zero. So I'll just write zero equals okay. Um, okay, and then I'm gonna well, the way I'm gonna group it is like okay, we got some dividends while we were on the stack for that brief period of time. Okay, I'm gonna combine you know v of t plus delta minus v of t, that, that one times v of t. This is the stock appreciation over that time period. And then as, and then we're left with minus delta r v of t, all right? So um, yeah, uh, so you get the dividends. You get the stock, however much it appreciated, which could be negative. Um, and then you pay uh, r times v. You pay r times how much you borrowed for that delta r times however much you borrowed. Okay, so you're you're paying an interest rate for a brief instant of time. You're getting that pro the flow of profits, and you're getting the change in v. Okay, whatever that may be, and this should be zero. Okay, so so this, um, you know we this this is cool, but but you know we we want it to be invariant to delta, so we're going to divide by delta, get a, a limit which is going to generate a derivative basically. Okay, so divide by delta, then we get pi of t plus you know essentially a, a what's clearly just gonna limit to the derivative of v minus r times v of t. Okay, so we got that. Take the limit as delta goes to zero. Okay, so then we get pi of t uh, plus v dot of t minus r v of t. Zero. Okay. So that's an equation. I mean, it, it, it relates v. I mean, it relates v and v dot to pi. Okay, and then usually, for I don't know reasons uh, which are not really well defined, we'll we'll write it like this. Okay, so I'm just rearranging terms at this point. We're gonna write it like this, sort of the canonical form. Okay, but if you if you um, another way you I mean you can write it any inf infinity number of ways, but I'm going to talk about sort of the different interpretations. Okay, this is v dot of t. All right, so this is like how I'll usually write it. And I I mean, the, one of the reasons to write it like this is that this looks similar to stuff we've seen before. Remember Hamiltonian conditions, the discount rate times the thing minus its derivative is equal to some flow stuff. And we even saw how to integrate this out, you know, so it had that this is equivalent to v being the net present value or the, the integrated value of pi. Okay, so so this is semi-familiar. Okay, um, you can also if you think about it like this here. Um, so so with this no arbitrage stuff, really, what what it means? Another way to think about it is just that it you should be indifferent between taking v dollars and and uh, putting it in the bank in a bond yielding interest rate r and and buying a stock, right? If you if you were not indifferent between those two, you could cook up some scheme to make money. Okay, or, or equivalently, if, if, if you were not indifferent between those two, people would not be willing to hold one or the other because they would all flock to the one with higher returns. Okay, so the, the last equation here is saying, if you have V dollars, you can either put it in the bank and generate RV continuously over time, or you can buy this stock for this company and generate continuously over time some flow profit pi plus whatever the change in value is over time. Okay. So, so that's gonna, that's probably, I mean, that's that's much simpler logic. I wanted to go through exactly the mechanics of the no arbitrage, but that's simpler and, and in some sense equivalent logic, okay? Uh, but at the end of the day, you get an equation that relates pi and v, okay? All right, um, okay, so. <clears throat> in this case, our life is much easier, okay? Because, uh, well, it's actually not, it's slightly easier because pi is not just some random function, okay? It's 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 a thing that we actually know a quite a good deal about, okay? And so, well, what do we know about pi? Me, um, well, okay, maybe, maybe it is a random function, okay? But let, let's let's review what we know about pi. 
it, it's not like entirely, you know, it's content. It's probably continuous, although we haven't really shown that. But here's what we know about pi, that it's equal to this thing here, right? The reason I'm saying we don't know anything about it is because in principle, I haven't told you how W and P are moving around. They could do it. They could in principle be doing anything. It turns out that they're not going to be moving um, any in a weird way over time, okay? And in particular, P is going to converge to some constant in a, in a steady state and actually immediately, it turns out. Um, <clears throat> And like, which is it is not going to be dynamics for it. Uh, and then W and N, well, they're going to be growing. Okay, so N is going to be growing continuously over time. And then W, because the, the economy is growing, is that's also going to be growing continuously over time. Uh, I should forget what the net. We'll we'll find out. Um, it's not necessarily true that their their ratio is going to be constant. Their, their ratio is. Well, yeah, I forget, I forget what the, so like from this equation, we know that um, the top here should be growing at the same rate as the bottom. So we know that the growth rate of W in, in the long run should be equal to the growth rate of N plus the growth rate of pi. Okay, so we know that. We know certain things. Um, I think when you solve it all out, uh, that, well, well, I think N ends up growing and pi, I think ends up shrinking. We'll, we'll find out, okay? Um, but, but it, I mean, in some sense, it doesn't really matter, okay? Because uh, the only thing that's important here is that um, in the long run, Okay, pi is going to be growing exponentially at some rate. Okay, it's 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 the the product or quotient of things that are either not moving that are parameters or are growing exponentially. Okay, uh, so it, it'll have some well-defined growth rate. Okay, um, that's all, and that's going to be simple enough. Okay, to, to for us. Okay, um, right. So so uh, and then yeah. So that that's. That, and, and, but at this point, we don't need to assume anything, okay? Uh, but what we are going to do is transform this into a slightly more uh, convenient form, okay? So so in general, I'm going to drop um, so the, the T dependence, okay? But it, it, it's still possible that things are, are varying with T, okay? So, uh, but I'll just write it, you know, RV minus V dot is equal to pi, okay? So that's sort of the end result of this whole value side quest thing, which is that we can find an equation for the value, okay? And and the trick here is you can divide by V, divide this equation by V and you get R minus V dot over V is equal to pi over V, okay? So this means that if V is growing at some constant rate, which which we will assume in, in a balanced growth path or steady state notion it will be, then well, the R is going to converge to some constant too. So that means that pi and V themselves should be growing at the same rate. Okay, so, so this immediately uh, will imply that, you know, basically G pi should be equal to GV sort of in the long run in steady state. Okay. In the short run, things can kind of always move around. R could move around, GV could move around. But in the long run, they should there should be some proportionality between pi and V. Okay. Um, and then the other thing you can do is, you know, if, if you just write G sub V for that growth of V and say, well, it's something, we don't know what it is, but let's just say that, you know, just for simple simplification purposes, you can write this as such. And you can even solve for V itself by bringing it back and dividing. So you get V is equal to pi over R minus GV. Okay, so... That's that's V. I mean, that's this isn't super helpful because we don't yet know what GV is. Okay, but it's this equation nonetheless holds. Okay, and so you can see that there's some proportionality between pi and V. Okay, so remember that we wanted that W linear in W to <clears throat> to to also apply to V, and, and in fact it does. Okay. Um, okay, so so we can use this. All right, so we're and in fact. Um, you know, so 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 okay. Here's what I'm saying. Uh, GV in the in a. This is where where 
the reason I'm being kind of cagey here is we want to be careful about what we're assuming. Are we assuming steady state or are we, are we letting things go full on general? Because you can assume steady state and solve and, and go through and you'll get the right answer. Okay. Or you can not assume steady state and, and say, okay, well, what if there were dynamics going on here in the short run as we converge to steady state? Okay. And then you can solve for what those dynamics are, you know, just like in, in any of the models we've done so far. Okay. So um, I want to keep things general. Okay, so that we can solve the dynamics. Okay, the funny thing is there are no dynamics. When you solve, when you solve for the dynamics, you find that there are no dynamics. Okay, so it's a bit it's like you do all this work to allow for dynamics, and then you realize that there are none. But nonetheless, it's you know in general you don't want to um, preclude these things right off the bat. Uh, you want to solve for them and sort of prove explicitly that there aren't dynamics. Okay, so so we're going to keep things general for now, and then we'll we'll see how they how they kind of pan out. All right. Um, okay, so that that's we we've, we've converted pi into v. Okay, so then you know if we if we want to plug in, so now we have v is you know like one over r minus g v. Okay, times pi, which we know is uh, what is pi w p over epsilon minus one times n. Okay, so so that's our our uh, expression for v. Okay. Um, okay, and then I'm I'm out of time, so we're not gonna be able to solve the model fully. But I'll at least tell you what's the equation that will ultimately lead us to a solution. Okay, so once we have the value, then we can really plug that into the free entry condition for research. Okay, so let's bring back that production function for ideas. So this is what our <clears throat> production function for ideas looks like. Okay, and the rate of new products creation is you, you build on existing products. So there's an n proportionality and in particular it's n to the one. So phi is one. And also researchers have linear, uh, they have constant productivity. They're, they're, there's a linear production function for, for ideas in terms of researchers. Okay, so uh, if you think about, um, think, think, think about yourself as some research boutique research firm you 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 hire researchers generate new products hopefully and then you either operate the firms that result yourself with your newfound infinite length patent or you sell you sell the idea off to a firm that then does that it doesn't it's equivalent okay so but think about you're this boutique research firm um so your choice is how many researchers are going to hire if i hire if i hire our researchers i'm going to uh generate in expectation, gamma, well, in the most general sense, I'm going to generate n dot new researchers, sorry, new ideas, each of which is value v. This is an expectation, and things are linear, so that's fine. Uh, and I have to pay w to each of my researchers, of which there are. R. Okay, so this is up. This is the profit in general. Okay, of this boutique research firm. Okay, so um, then we know we can plug in, you know, n dot is equal to gamma and r times v minus wr. Okay, and then you can see we can factor out that r because we've assumed linearity in both production and cost. Um, and so then we get r times gamma and v minus w here. Okay, so... And, and and the free entry condition is just saying that this should be zero. That if it was positive, more firms would enter and somehow it would equilibrate. If it was negative, then no firms would enter and we would have no research. Okay, so um, it should be zero either way. And actually what you get here at the end is, is kind of like a complementary slackness condition, okay? Because it's saying, well, either uh, this, this thing here is zero, Right, that the marginal benefit equals the marginal cost, or uh, R is zero. Okay, so it could also be that um, this thing is negative, in which case no one would enter, and hence R would be zero. Okay, so it's either no one enters, and it's just a total wash, and there's no innovation, which is in principle possible, or people do enter, and this right-hand side uh, thing is equal to zero. Okay, 
So, so we can get zero research. We'll, we'll usually preclude that parametrically, but, but it's not impossible. But, but if in the case that we do have positive research, positive R, then we should have gamma and V being equal to W. Okay. Um, and I know I'm over time, but you know, if you just plug in for V, just, just to give, give a little preview, then what are you going to get? Well, you'll get, you know, gamma over R minus GV times WP, the N will cancel there so then this should be equal to w and then the w's cancel and then we're kind of almost in business we can almost solve for p the only thing we don't know is gv but we can get that okay we can we can it's actually kind of tricky but we can do it and then once we do that we'll be all set okay so we're, we're you can see there, there's light at the end of the tunnel here what we have a path towards solving for p once we know p we know r and, and we kind of can back out the growth rate and everything we'll be able to figure everything out just from knowing that allocation of labor between production and research, which is kind of the big societal level uh, choice. Okay. All right. So that's, that's it.